So uh, today I'd like to talk to you about designing for cognitive bias using mental shortcuts for good instead of evil. My name is David Dillon Thomas and I run a company called David Dillon Thomas LLC. I basically go around and get people excited about and give them tools for more inclusive design. Uh, I wrote a book called Design for Cognitive Bias. It's available now. Um, and the road to this book uh, begins with a podcast I used to do called the Cognitive Bias Podcast. Um, the road to the podcast actually begins with this woman. Her name is Iris Bonnet, and she gave a talk once called Gender Equality by Design. It's a fantastic talk. It's on YouTube. I highly recommend you check it out. But one of the points she makes is that a lot of um, uh, inherent racial and gender bias often comes back to pattern recognition. Uh, and what she means is imagine that you're hiring a web developer and the image that might pop into your head when I say the words web developer might be skinny white guy. And it has nothing to do, you know, it's not at all, you don't think that uh, uh, men are better at programming than women, far from it. But the pattern that may have been built up in your mind from movies and television, from offices you may have worked in, uh, might make that equation. And if you see a name at the top of a resume that doesn't quite fit that equation, all of a sudden you might start giving that resume the side eye. Now, when I saw that so much uh, racial and gender bias could sometimes come back to something as simple and dare I say human as uh, pattern recognition, mm -hmm. I decided I need to learn everything I possibly can about cognitive bias. And so I did. This is the rational wiki page for cognitive biases. There's well over a hundred here. And I realized I am not going to figure this out in a day. So I took one a day. And the next day I'd move on to the next one. And this turned me into the guy who wouldn't shut up about cognitive bias. And eventually my friend said, Dave, please just get a podcast. Now it's worth establishing from the jump, what is cognitive bias? And at the end of the day, it has to do with a series of shortcuts your mind is taking just to get it through the day. Every day we have to make something like a trillion decisions, right? Even right now, I'm making decisions about how fast to talk, what to do with my hands, where to look. And if I thought carefully about every single one of those decisions, I'd never get anything done. So it's actually a good thing that a lot of our lives are spent on autopilot. But sometimes the autopilot gets it wrong. And we call those errors cognitive biases. Now, here's a fun one. It's called illusion of control. It happens when you are playing a game where you have to roll a die. If you need a high number, you tend to roll the die really hard. If you need a lower number, you tend to roll it gently. And we all know it makes no difference how hard you roll the die. But in situations where we don't have control, we like to feel like we have control. And we uh, embody uh, that, that desire in how we roll the die. Now, this next one is not so fun. It's called confirmation bias. And it happens when um, you have an idea stuck in your head and you really only look for evidence to confirm that idea. And if you ever see evidence that doesn't confirm the idea, you yell fake news and you move on. So a really powerful example of this came during the lead up to the Iraq war. The whole idea was Saddam was saying to weapons of mass destruction, we need to get in there and get him before he gets us. Seemed like a compelling argument. As it turns out, not so much with weapons of mass destruction. And within a year, the president of the United States, who had insisted there were weapons of mass destruction there, said, yeah, we didn't find anything. Regardless, the number of people who believed there were weapons of mass destruction stayed very high, so high that even 14 years later, over 50% of Republicans and over 30% of Democrats believed, yeah, there were weapons of mass destruction there. This is an extremely powerful bias, and we are going to come back to it. Now, part of the problem we have fighting these biases is that uh, you may not even realize you have them, right? There's literally a bias called the bias blind spot where you think you don't have any biases, but you're sure everybody else does. Um, part of the problem spotting it is that about 95% of cognition happens below the threshold of conscious thought. So we're making these decisions so quickly, we don't even realize we've made them. So the next time somebody asks why you did something, the most honest answer you can give is how the hell should I know? Even if you know about the bias, probably still do it anyway. There's a bias called anchoring, and the way it works is I could ask everybody listening to this to write down the last two numbers of your phone number, and then I could say, okay, we're going to bid on a bottle of wine. Those of you who wrote down lower numbers are going to bid lower. Those of you who wrote down higher numbers are going to bid higher. It's called anchoring. It's a thing. But here's the thing. I could tell you all of that before we begin the experiment. I'd still do it. In fact, I could say, I will pay you cash money not to do it. You'd probably still do it. Now. The good news is that there are design and content choices we can make to help keep some of these biases at bay or even sometimes use them for good. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. 
So let's get back to that skinny white dude. So as it turns out, an experiment after experiment, if you have two identical resumes and the only difference is the uh, name at the top of the resume, if it is a male sounding name, it tends to keep going through the process. And if it is a female sounding name, it tends to stay on the pile. Um, but here's the thing. Why do you need that information? What about the name is helping you, the hiring manager, figure out who to hire? Think of it like a signal to noise problem, right? The signal, the thing that uh, is helping you figure out who to hire, right, are the qualifications, the experience. What might actually be getting in the way based on patterns you may have grown up with are things like gender or race or really what you're reading into the name in terms of the gender or the race. Now, the city of Philadelphia um, actually did a round of anonymized hiring for one of their uh, developer roles. What they found uh, was that one, even in the high-tech world of web development, the best way to anonymize a resume is to have an intern physically print it out, get a marker, and redact it like a CIA document. Uh, the other thing they discovered is once they found a resume they liked, they would want to go to GitHub, a code repository, to see that web developer's portfolio. But the second they got there, the web developer's profile would load and all the personal information would be there and ruin the experiment. So clever people that they are, they... Um, Right, wrote up a, a Chrome plugin, a little program that would anonymize all that data as the page loaded. And then just to complete the circle, they took that code and put it back on GitHub. It's there now if you want to try this yourself. Another really important term to think about is called cognitive fluency. And it's this idea that if something looks like it's going to be easy to read, I will assume whatever it's talking about is also probably easy to do. By the same token, if something looks like it's going to be hard to read, I'll assume whatever it's talking about, it's probably hard to do. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I've been making a lot of pancakes lately. Uh, this is a recipe for pancakes. And uh, the text is kind of small and clumped together. And I might glance at that and think, you know what? I bet pancakes are kind of hard to make. I don't know if I want to make pancakes. I could take that same content, give it nice full width imagery, little scannable bursts of text. And I might glance at that and think, you know what? I bet pancakes aren't that hard. Maybe I'll make pancakes. A two minute video, forget about it. We're making pancakes. Now, think about this when it comes to deciding whether or not to drive or take public transportation. I take one look at that printed schedule, and I assume immediately that uh, public transportation is impossible. I'm going to drive. I take one look at that app screen, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe public transportation isn't that hard. Now, I can't see your faces, so I'm going to ask you to vote in your hearts. <laughs> uh, how many of you think that Marie Curie was born in 1866? Okay, how many of you think that Marie Curie was born in 1868? Okay, you're both wrong. She was born in 1867. But the point is, people usually tend to pick 1868. Why? Because when something is easier to read, we actually think it's more true. But it gets worse. If something rhymes, we actually think it's more true. This has consequences. Now. What's happening here is that we like things that are easier to process, right? Things that are easier to process feel more certain. I'll give you an example. If I ask you, what did you get for your fifth birthday? You got a toy truck, right? You might not feel too confident about that answer, right? It's hard to uh, remember. It's hard to process. It doesn't feel very certain. If I asked you, okay, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You might feel pretty certain about that answer, right? It's easy to remember, easy to process. It feels very certain. Things that rhyme are easier to remember, easier to process, feel more certain. Things that use big, bold fonts and imagery and plain language, easier to remember, easier to process, feel more certain. Now, this becomes important when it comes to things we need to believe. In America, we have a crisis where, generally speaking, African-Americans do not believe health information that comes from the government. In a 2002 survey, when given the statement, the government usually tells the truth about major health issues like HIV AIDS, only 37% of African-American respondents agreed with that statement. By the time you get to 2016, that number has dropped to 18%. Now I could do a whole other talk about why there are legit reasons that African-Americans have concerns about health information that comes from the government. But the fact remains, this is information that could save lives. So if it needs to rhyme, if it needs to use plain language and pictograms, so be it. Now, when I first put this in my book, my editor very wisely challenged me and said, okay, that's great in theory, but can you point to actual instances where plain language and pictograms have saved lives? And I'm glad she did because it really forced me to do the work and find some really interesting examples. 
So here we have uh, women who are smoking while pregnant. And when they're given information at the third grade reading level, right, easier to process, uh, they were more likely to stop smoking while pregnant and even six weeks postpartum. Here we have uh, people who are caregivers, right, helping other people take their medication. When they had a plain language pictogram-based intervention, we saw decreased medication dosing errors and improved adherence to actually taking the medication. Now you might think, okay, that's great for uh, plain language and pictograms, but rhyming, really? Let's talk about click it or ticket. Here in the States, we had a bunch of uh, states <laughs> roll out legislation that said that if you don't buckle your seatbelt, uh, you can get a ticket. And um, this legislation all on its own did a lot of good, especially with uh, older drivers, but not as much with younger drivers. So they rolled out the click it or ticket campaign. And the results were that national belt use among young men and women ages 16 to 24 moved from 65% to 72% and 73% to 80% respectively. And just to put that in more human terms, for every percentage point you go up in people actually buckling their seatbelt, about 270 lives are saved. So rough math, that's about 4,000 lives saved in part through rhyming. It's silly, but it works. Uh, the most dangerous bias in the world, in my opinion, is the framing effect. And it starts out innocently enough. Let's say you go to a store and you see a sign that says beef, 95% lean. And next to it, you see a sign that says beef, 5% fat. Which one do you think people are gonna line up for? It's the same thing, right? But I framed one of them in a way to make it seem more appealing. Now, that's all good and well when we're talking about beef, but what if I said, should we go to war in April or should we go to war in May? You see what I did there? We're no longer talking about whether or not it's a good idea to go to war in the first place. And wars have been started over less. Now, if you are multilingual, right, bilingual, you have a secret weapon against the framing effect. If you can think about the decision in your non-primary language, you are less likely to fall for the scam. Now, I speak a little bit of French. And if I try to think about the uh, beef decision in French, it would go something like, let's see, beef, that's beef, that's a lot of L's. Um, let's see, 95%, no, wait, and by the time I've done all of that processing, right, I can see right through the scam. Now, the uh, framing effect can actually be used for good. There's an experiment where you show an audience a photo like this and you ask them, should this person drive this car? And what you basically get is a, um, a policy debate, right? Some people are saying, oh, uh, old people are bad at everything. Don't let them drive. And other people are saying, oh, respect your elders. How dare you? That's ageist. Let people do what they want. Um, all you really learn by the end of that conversation is who's on what side. Now, I can take that same photo, show it to another audience and ask, how might this person drive this car? Right. And what I'll get is more of a design discussion, right? Uh, some people might say, what if we change the shape of the steering wheel? Or what if we move the dashboard? And what I might learn by the end of that conversation is several different ways that person might be able to drive that car. I only changed two words, but by changing the frame of the conversation, I changed the entire conversation. In fact, what if I zoom out a little more and ask, how might we do a better job of moving people around? Because that's why the guy was in the car in the first place. He was here but he wanted to be over there. And if I frame it this way, things like public transportation are on the table. Now, I wanna close by talking about our biases because these are the ones that can really get our users in trouble. So I told you we'd come back to this. For a long time, I had a misconception of what the scientific method was. I thought it was, I have an idea about how the world works. I am gonna test that idea. Um, if I get a good result, a whole bunch of other people are gonna try the same thing. And if they get the same result, great. Check that off, write it down, it's a law, let's move on. After talking to some actual scientists, I found out it's a little more complicated than that. I have an idea about how the world works. I am going to test that idea. Um, and if I get a good result, a whole bunch of other people are gonna try the same thing. If they get the same result, great. I get to spend the rest of forever trying to prove myself wrong. I have to ask myself if I'm wrong, what else might be true? Then I have to go and try and prove it, right? I got to go and try and prove that. Um, this is a much more rigorous approach and it was designed specifically to fight confirmation bias. Now, as designers, it's very easy for us to leave good design on the table because we fall in love with our first idea. Let me show you just how easy. Let's say we're gonna play a game with a computer and the computer is gonna show us these numbers and that question mark and say, hey, 
put whatever number you want where the question mark is, and I'll tell you whether that number fits the pattern. Put in as many numbers as you like, and when you um, think you know the answer, tell me what you think the pattern is. So if you're like me, the first number you try is eight. And the computer says, congratulations, that fits the pattern. Would you like to try another number? And if you're like me, you say, nah, I got this. The pattern is even numbers. And the computer says no. And the reason it says no is because I never tried this. The pattern is not even numbers. The pattern is simply every number is higher than the number that came before it, which is a much more elegant solution, probably easier to code, probably cheaper to build, but I never got there because I was so in love with my even numbers idea. Now, there are approaches to help us avoid this outcome. One of them is called red team, blue team. And the idea is you have a blue team who does the initial research, maybe gets as far as a wireframe, but before they go any further, the red team comes in for one day and their job is to go to war with the blue team. They're there to find every hidden assumption, every more elegant solution, every potential cause of harm that the blue team missed because they were so in love with their first idea. And I like this approach because it's fairly economical. I don't have to go to my boss and say, hey, from now on, we got to hire two teams for every project and they got to check each other's work every day. No, I need one team for one day to make it a little less likely that we're going to put something harmful out into the world. A great tool for this approach is called speculative design. And it's kind of like that show Black Mirror, which if you haven't seen it, is basically a twilight zone for tech. It, you take some near future technology and you tell a story about what would happen if real human beings got their hands on it. And it's always a terrible result. Um, I think anybody working on a new technology by law should have to write a Black Mirror episode about it first. Uh, but this is a real job. The folks down at Superflux went to the United Arab Emirates to help them think about the future of energy. And the question on the table was, should we stay on the road of fossil fuels or should we start investing in renewables? So one of the things that Superflux did was to say, okay, let's figure out what your air quality is going to be like if you stay on the road of fossil fuels uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. But they didn't just figure it out. They bottled it. And then they made them breathe it. And by the time you get to even uh, five years out, it's unbreathable. So uh, by the end of that engagement, the UAE announced that they were going to invest over $150 billion in renewables. The final bias I want to talk about is called the defamation de I Told you I speak French. So this is a bias where you see the whole world through the lens of your job, which in the workaholic world, a lot of us inhabit might seem like a good idea, right up until it isn't. The paparazzi who ran Princess Di off the road that night probably thought they were doing a good job. And technically speaking, they were. They were getting really difficult to get photographs that were gonna fetch them a really high price. What they weren't doing such a good job at was being human beings. Now, the former police commissioner of Philadelphia, a guy named Ramsey, when he first took the job, uh, asked all of his officers the same question. What do you think your job is? And a lot of them would answer to enforce the law. And he would say, that seems like a reasonable answer, but what if I told you your job is to protect civil rights? Now, that's a bigger job, right? It encompasses enforce the, enforcing the law, but it's a bigger job because it, it forces you to treat people with dignity. Now, I have had this slide in here for a while and every year, every month, it gets harder to get through, it gets more emotional, but I keep it in here because now more than ever, it is clear how we define our jobs is a matter of life and death. Now, Ramsey was telling his officers that day that their jobs were harder than they think. And I'm here to tell us our jobs are harder than we think, right? It isn't just design cool stuff. We have to find a way to define our jobs that allows us to be more human to each other. Now, people are working on this already. You've got Mike Montero out at Mule Design creating a design ethics booklet that's kind of a Hippocratic oath for designers. Uh, you've got the Design Justice Network, which is doing amazing work in this area, and they have these 10 principles. I'm just going to read you the first two. One, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Now, if you just try to stick to these first two, you have got your work cut out for you. It's the difference between what Erica Hall calls user-centered design versus shareholder-centered design. We often think we're doing the former, when in fact, we're kind of doing the latter. There uh, is a great intervention for this called the Tarot Cards of Tech. And it's this website, and you go to it, and there are these cards, and you click on them, and they flip over and give you these really provocative questions about what you're working on. How might cultural habits change 
how your product is used and how might your products change cultural habits. Now, if Twitter has asked itself this before it launched, we might live in a very different world today. Even software engineers are getting in on this, right? So the Never Again Pledge was signed by a bunch of data scientists and software engineers when they saw that their work with data was being used to hurt immigrants. And they pointed to a very long and sordid history of data being used to hurt excluded populations and said, look, we don't want to be a part of that history. And here's a list of things we're going to do to make sure that never happens, up to and including destroying unethical data sets. This kind of collective action is playing out at places like Google, where Project Maven was a battlefield AI, that when the people working on it saw what it was, they said, look, we did not get into this business to make weapons. If you make us work on this, we're going to walk. And Google backed down. They walked away from a $250 million project with the military. And then they turned right around and did Dragonfly, which is censored search in China. So this battle is ongoing. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. Now, this is not some software guru at a TED Talk. It's Martin Luther King. Over 50 years ago, he saw this to be true. So the question I will leave all of us with is, how can we define our jobs in a way that allows us to be more human to each other? Thank you. Thank you, David. That was very interesting. Uh, you have uh, quite a, a lot of thoughts. And um, when I was listening to you, uh, the first two questions that occurred is uh, how do we, maybe you have uh, some tips how to define those vices um, in your job, for example, right? When I'm thinking about my job, how to uh, see that I'm using some bias and find myself at that uh, situation in order to think differently. And the same is about other people. When they are talking to me, for example, someone is talking to me and sees that I'm a woman or something like that, how to understand that they are biased to something and what to do in that situation. Sure. So these are two, two very distinct situations, but two, unfortunately, very common situations, right? So with the first one, where you're trying to check your own bias, on a design team, on a product team, one of the best things you can do is to start by identifying those biases. So there is a, um, a, a basically a two-hour meeting you can do called an assumption audit. And what you do is at the beginning of a project, before you even kick off, you get your team in a room and you ask five key questions. One, who are we? Right? And you're only going to self-identify as you feel comfortable, but you're going to think about things like gender and age, nationality, income, what have you. And then you're going to ask, okay, well, how might those identities influence this thing we're working on? Then you ask, who's not in the room? Right? Anybody here ever been incarcerated? Anybody here ever had their immigration status questioned? Right? And then you ask the fourth question, which is, well, how might that lack of perspective uh, compromise this thing we're working on? And then the final and most important question is, what might we do to include, honor, and give power to these voices during the design process? And I choose those words very carefully, right? Include, yeah, sure, talk to people. Uh, honor, maybe pay them for their time. Uh, give power. Is there any way you can identify the folks who are going to be impacted by this product, who have absolutely no say in the creation of this product? And can you actually give them more power, more say? Uh, and the reason you want to do that is because they're going to have to live with what you build. So doing that and bringing in those external, A, identifying, like literally asking the question of what biases might I have, but then bringing in outside perspectives um, and giving them some degree of say helps check your biases because the people you bring in are going to have their own biases, but they're going to be different biases that come from different lived experiences. And if you're thinking about power, uh, exper lived experiences that have sometimes been the target of some previous products, right, that might not have gone so well. So I think that's one way to think about dealing with the biases you might not be aware of. In terms of dealing with people and recognizing they are being biased towards you, um, one of the critical questions you need to ask, and this is assuming this isn't, we're not talking about like a toxic work environment where it's actual harm is being committed, at which point you need to either get out or talk to HR, like that's kind of a, a different issue. But if it's more, someone just doesn't see you or doesn't see what they're doing, you kind of have to decide whether you're more interested in changing their beliefs or changing their behavior. And the distinction I'm making there is changing beliefs. Like literally, if someone doesn't understand that women are as good at their jobs as men are, that's a very, very long road that probably involves some therapy <laughs> like to get them to that stage. If, on the other hand, you need them to hear you and listen to you, 
that is more about understanding what biases they have that everyone has. And that becomes more about, you know, persuasion and basically understanding what problem are they trying to solve and framing what you're trying to get them to do in terms of that. Um, so an, an example I would give is we have a politician here in the States, Stacey Abrams, this amazing uh, uh, senator who, um, or, or, or when she was a councilwoman, she uh, basically had to work with a group, a very conservative group we have here called the Tea Party, which you may have heard out there, I don't know. I, I hope you haven't. Um, <laughs> but uh, she needs to work with them around climate change. So there was a bill coming out that was gonna be terrible for the environment. And she needed their votes to make sure that bill didn't pass. But instead of trying to convince them that climate change was real, right, change their beliefs, instead she tried to convince them that property taxes were real because that was their issue, taxes. So she said, look, if this bill comes through, there's going to be erosion of the soil bed that's going to ruin the property value in this place that you're trying to protect. So, you know, how are you going to vote, right? So she focused on the thing that they care about to get them to hear her because if she stood there trying to convince them about climate change for hours, nothing was going to happen. That was not going to be the way to get the behavior she wanted. So both of those are noble goals, beliefs versus behavior, but in the situation, you kind of need to figure out, okay, what, what's critical here? Is it more important that this person change their opinion about this bias, or is it more point, important that I just get them to do that I, the thing that I need them to do? And it's, you know, it's a case by case. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question, um, that might be quite a wide question, but it's uh, quite interesting. Uh, what was your journey of defining those biases? Maybe so, answer so yeah, like I will, I will say like on, in the broad scale, like I said at the beginning, I had this podcast where I literally did a hundred episodes, each one on a different bias. And that was me learning about like these biases for myself. And this is a journey I think we all need to go on individually. It's kind of that scientific method thing I said, where it's like, take the thing that you're sure is true and ask yourself if I'm wrong, what else might be true? So as a small example, I, I'm a black man who lives in America. And as a result, I'm very fearful of the police. And, but at one point I had to ask myself, okay, how fearful, how fearful should I be of the police? What are the actual odds that me as a black man would get shot by the police? And so I did some research and what I found was, yes, it is far more likely that I will be the victim of a uh, police crime or a police shooting than a white person. But there is a group for whom it is far worse. Indigenous Americans, right? Native Americans are almost 10 times more likely to be shot by the police than I, which I had no idea was the case. And if I hadn't actually asked the question, I would never have found that out. So I think for each of us, it's important to ask ourselves, what are those critical, critical beliefs that we hold dear? And just take a little time, because that was like, honestly, 10 minutes of Googling answered my question, right? Just take a little time to challenge that idea and say, okay, well, if I'm wrong about this thing, what else might be true? Let me go see if that's true. So for me and my journey, that's how I've been kind of thinking through these different biases I know that I have. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, that's an interesting journey. Um, well, thank you, Dylan. Our time is up.